Hello. All right. Well, um, today I'm just going to give you a really quick tour of a method for exploring some genes of interest, primarily using UniPro. And the reason I'm going to be primarily using UniPro is it's got a really robust search engine. It's easy to download and extract the uh, sequences that I want. And finally, it connects to the protein sequences. And so what we're eventually going to do is we're going to import these sequences into Mega, uh, which you can just find by searching like Mega Genomics. Um, so for example, Mega Genomics, there is the software. It's a very nice, well-referenced piece of software that's pretty easy to use. It's very forgiving as well. So it will typically just allow it to work, even if what you're doing isn't like the perfect um, analysis for your data. And that's kind of fair. What you're going to find is that a lot of analyses, <laughs> cat in my face, there's a lot of analyses that work um, okay, even if they are not perfect for your exact situation. Now, in your project, I do want you trying to think about what your, your situation is and doing a little bit of research to try and find that within some of the time limits that I've said are appropriate for this project. Um, but uh, let, let's at least just get going and kind of show you this process of exploration and discovery. And the, it's a fun part of science. This is a very open-ended project. I'm more just interested in you guys getting to have some of this experience. So what I've done here is I have gone to unipro.org and I've just typed in TFL1. TFL1 is a pet project of mine. Um, it seems to be a gene that uh, is important to the flowering of pecan, uh, or at least it's in that locus that helps determine the uh, sexual cycle of pecan, which is like it's a sequential hermaphrodite. So it's either the male organs first, and then the female organs or the female organs first and then the male organs, and it just segregates. Uh, <clears throat> but it's just a small region within a, a genome, and within it, there is two very distinct versions of this gene. And what's interesting is they both seem to be expressed. There isn't really a difference in expression, but I believe, and I haven't proven this yet, is that there is a difference in function, that it is actually one of those kind of cool and, and maybe even rare cases where a, uh, a associated mutation isn't just a like disruption in gene function, it's a change in gene function that these loci have been allowed to evolve for a very long period of time. And that's what my analysis says is that throughout these regions, they are extremely divergent. Um, and so it seems like they've not been able to recombine in a very long time and that they've been allowed to, to evolve separately. And now they have different purposes. A purpose for one of these haplotypes is that it stimulates the production of male organs before the production of female organs, allowing it to pollinate the other one. So it's a really like fun question. I'm interested in like, okay, well, um, can I look across the diversity of um, flowering plants? Um, I am working with pecan in this case. And so I'm kind of interested in the dicot side of flowering plants, but I would pro I would at least <laughs> like to include something maybe even as far away as like ferns or some gymnosperms or a couple of our other groups, maybe some cycads and some other plants. Um, but with that, let's start exploring the data. So I started off with just searching the gene TFL1 in UniPro. And right off the bat, I can see that there's a lot of things that refer to TFL1 that are not TFL1. So here is one that is TFL1. So this is the G name is TFL1. It's terminal flowering locus. Um, whenever you mutate it, it will no longer flower at the tip of the branch. It will only flower on like side. Um, in fact, it was originally discovered in, I believe, Snapdragon and where it was given the name Centro radialis because it would just cause the flowers to form in a really strange way. Um, but that said, there's a lot of other genes that seem to be related to it. So you can see mother of FT and TFL1. Now I don't actually know enough about MFT to say, is this like truly like an ancestral 
um, gene that then duplicated and became FT and TFL1. I, I'm not sure. I do know it looks very similar. My cat is rubbing on the microphone. Um, I know it looks very similar. And so uh, it, it's certainly related, but it's not the same gene. Um, I can go through here and I can see that there's some other related genes. Uh, I'm not sure what the relationship to this lipase one is. Maybe it's just mentioned somewhere in there. Um, but the reason why a lot of these are floating to the top is that they've been uh, reviewed. And so this is like a really nice part about the UniPro is that its default sorting really prioritizes the availability of large amounts of information for a given gene. Um, so regardless, I can kind of scroll around here. I can see a few different genes. What I will probably end up doing is I will pick TFL1. I will pick TFT, uh, uh, its counterpart that stimulates production of flowers where TFL uh, reduces the production of flowers. And MFT, which I don't know much about, um, but is, they're all related to each other. Now, uh, I, I really, for your projects, I just want you to have a rationale. I, I don't really care what that rationale is. I just want them linked in some way, thematically, by go category, which is kind of thematically, that's your functional and your biological um, like patterns. Uh, maybe it's by domain, so uh, what it includes. So like this is a Mads box binding protein. You can see that there's a few entries in here that have that uh, domain. I believe that would be yeah, AGL 14. Um, regardless, I've clicked on a few different um, cat. I've <laughs> clicked on a few different columns. And so let me show you how you can view some of this data all next to each other. So if I go to here and I um, scroll up, I can see that there are a lot of different boxes I could try and view. Um, I was interested in finding genes that were related to, F for, to TFL. And so I, I looked through these and I said, all right, I, I really want to stick with things that are both similar in function, but also similar in actual composition. Like what is the patterns found on its sequence? And so that's what I was really trying to select these for. And that's how you ended up seeing all of these columns. I then click save, and that's what allows me to view this. And so if I kind of play with these a little bit, what you'll find is that what links this FT and TFL1 is the fact that it is these, oh, I'm gonna have to scroll the word, phosphatidylethanolamine binding protein family. Yeah, that's a mouthful. Um, but I'm gonna use that information. And we're going to refine our search to try and find proteins and sequences that are similar. So I'm going to go back up to the top after having copied out that word. Um, actually, let me go check the name of that column real quick. Protein family. Okay. So let's go to advanced. So I want to not just search um, for the, the name TFL1. I want the gene TFL1. And then I'm kind of interested in ones that are pretty well characterized. So I'm, I, I could just search for just TFL1. That by itself would really be, be helpful. Um, but I also want to look at the protein family and just see what that results in. This may be a, um, a terminal process of exploration, but that's how this goes. It, it is an exploration. My cat is being very loving this morning. So I don't know if y'all can see it here. I'll distract you by letting you see my cat be cute. Um, protein existence. All right, I'm having trouble finding it. So why don't I just add that term anywhere? So if, if I have the name TFL1 and anywhere in its entry, it has this, oh boy, I can't pronounce it. Um, we should get a search result. So let's see what that gives us. All right, we've refined our search a little bit. 154, that's a much more reasonable starting position. Um, if I scroll through here, I can look at some of the amino acid links. These are very well controlled. They're well within 
the uh, comparable size without it getting just ridiculous. Um, I can see that it's mostly finding this certain family name. Uh, you may wonder why I'm not just clicking this, which would sort it. And for whatever reason, UniPro just keeps failing to sort that column. It, it usually would be successful, but it, I don't know why. Um, so right now I have sufficient data. Um, these are some of kind of the top most important ones. I do see that there are some replicates. So like grape is mentioned several times. That's not terribly surprising to me. A lot of the horticultural um, organisms have been studied at this gene in particular. Um, so I'm going to, um, <laughs> cat. I am going to expand my search to the top 50. Right now it's making a little bit more sense. That looks pretty good. And I'm just going to select them all for now. Okay. Um, we can refine our um, search um, afterwards. And I'm going to download the results as a FASTA. Now, I only want one sequence ultimately per species. And so for right now, I'm just going to get the canonical version. So, like the standard, um, as opposed to say a tweaked version. So, in, in the case of pecan, uh, the recessive version is the canonical version. It's what our reference, our main reference genome has. Um, in fact, the main reference genome is homozygous for the recessive. So it doesn't even have an isoform. Um, on the other hand, we have other reference sequences that are heterozygous. And we even have one now that is homozygous for the dominant with this whole locus being a major reason it was studied which is pretty cool. Also, it's just got ridiculously large nuts, which is also fun. So I'm going to download these. You can notice that it did download as a GZ file. Now, for me, it's very easy to open a GZ file because I've downloaded the software that I recommended. I still recommend it. Um, PPEA zip is my favorite. Um, so I am going to extract this to a location on my computer. So I'm going to just put it into downloads. This is uncompressing that data. Um, it actually even asked me if I want to delete the original um, compressed file. And I said, yes. So now I have that file. I am going to open that file in Mega, which I had already installed, but you would need to install. It says, do I want to analyze or align the file? Now, if it was already aligned, then we could just you know, analyze it, but it's not aligned yet. Uh, there's going to be gaps. Sometimes some of the proteins are going to start later than others. So I do want to um, align them first. Our reviewing it, we can already see that there's some pretty clear patterns in here. Of course, our protein sequences are beginning with an M, except for this one, uh, which if you look across it, it's clearly a little bit messy already. So. Um, some of these are not going to belong, and that is a thing that occurs. What you find is you do end up having to kind of curate your data um, the majority of the time. It's very rare that you just get lucky. Now, if you're doing a really small data set, that might be fine. So uh, the question now is, do I use cholesterol, W, or muscle? And really, the differences between them are subtle. Uh, where muscle tends to be better is when the edges are kind of ragged. Um, and so I can see that these are fairly different lengths at times. And so I do think I will use muscle. Um, my cholesterol W is really my go-to, um, but uh, we can even try both and see what the differences are and compare them. I would say for your analysis, that type of comparison would be a reasonable um, a reasonable extension. So for the extra credit section. Um, in fact, that was a, oh, I think I navigated away from it. Darn it. Uh, there, there is, I've seen whole projects that were just based on that question. Which one is better? And the answer is it's subtle. Muscle tends to be better at ragged edges. Clustal W um, tends to give like more independent, most optimized results. Um, so let's do this alignment. I'm going to use muscle because of that ragged edge. I'm going to just select them all and see what happens. So 
regarding why I'm doing um, protein, these are fairly diverse sequences. Um, the, if you actually look at the nucleotide sequence, which I've already recorded a couple of these um, where I did look at the nucleotide sequence and it just doesn't look great. It's not a good alignment. So you don't see the patterns we would want to see when trying to compare a fairly conserved gene. And it's just because the evolutionary distances are too large. But when I compare the amino acid sequence, I, I can get much cleaner, much more reasonable looking um, sequences. So uh, scrolling across, I can see that there is some pretty good alignments. Now, let me unselect this. And let's look across here and see if we need to do some data curation. So I can see that there are some sequences which are um, seem to be truncated in some way. Uh, so like all of these apple species, uh, malice is, I don't remember which one out there it is. There's your standard apple, but here is a bunch of related one. Again, uh, this is a really interesting gene for a lot of people, especially people who work in trees. So again, I am not at all surprised to see this many different sequences for malice. Um, I also just realized that whenever I downloaded the sequences, it downloaded all the sequence results since I hadn't manually specified which ones to download. And so um, that's just something to be aware of. Now, I'm going to go through and do some curation. Um, what we can do is we can just say, all right, well, I'm really only interested in non-truncated sequences. Uh, it might be easier though, if we just start off trying to visualize this. So uh, let me say, that is a step you need to do. This is not going to work. Things like this is just a fragment of Kinkris Americanus. I don't know what that one is, um, but this one's not a good alignment at all because it's just short. Um, this Bergeria, so that strawberry also seems to have some issues. It, it, it's a matter of curation, but we have a lot of replication in here and we really need to subset down our data. So that's what I'm going to do. Ah, too smaller. There we go. All right. So um, right now I have this file. I can save my session just so I don't lose my work. So let's call it, oops, I accidentally erased the right name. Let's call it um, TFL1 bulk initial. So now I want to kind of do some different analyses on it. All right, so it ran a phylogenetic analysis. Okay, I mean, I didn't actually know what that phylogenetic analysis button would do. That's a new button for this version. What I would normally do is after aligning it, I would then, and curating the data, I would try to go into one of these different algorithms in order to make it work. Now, a distance algorithm would give us the matrix that you need as the output for um, one of your files that you are being asked to generate. And so we could compare compute pairwise distances across this data. Would I like to use it? Yes, I would. Um, this is an amino acid. Uh, Poisson model is a uh, fine. That will be fine for me. Um, partial deletion, this is referring to how do you treat gaps? Um, should you analyze regions where, let's say there's a lot of like uh, different gaps. So for some of those spots where the uh, intron, or sorry, the exon had clearly just started to incorporate a few, a few amino acids upstream of like the actual like functional protein uh, in some of the lines, uh, this would be a good option. And that would mean that it's only going to be analyzed if it's at least present in 90% of the population. So I'm, I'm really look, wanting to analyze evolution across the conserved sequence. So some of these like short amino acid sequences that are clearly not like affecting gene function, I don't really want them analyzed. I, I really want to bias my analysis towards things which are being um, actively selected upon. Now, this bootstrap method is a really important step for getting variants 
um, across your estimations. There are some elements of randomness to this process, like how you start trying to do the analysis. Um, it inputs some random values in order to uh, allow it to um, make decisions during that process. So the bootstrap means that it's going to start going through all the permutations of that um, in order to come up with a variance in the results. So some results are going to pretty much be the same thing every time. So like Arabidopsis is not going to cluster with rice any of the times, but Arabidopsis might cluster with another brassica, which is the, the family that it's in. Um, and it may be closer to one species or maybe closer to another member of the brassica in a subsequent uh, bootstrap. So this will help you evaluate the variance in those results. Now, when we export our data, we're just going to get a raw distance matrix, but we'll come to that when we cross there. So let's run that analysis and see what happens. Three, 500, so I'm gonna pause while that goes so that you don't have to wait here with me. All right, everybody, our analysis has now finished. And so I am going to export this data to a file so that we can save it. Um, one thing to note is that uh, what we're looking at here is on the, <laughs> um, on the upper right, we have the ooh, I know it's just, we have the um, distances down here, and then we have the um, standard or variance between the groupings up here, and that can be adjusted by using one of these toggles. Uh, you can show precision um, based on the decimal points so that allows you to visualize it a little bit more easily. In the end, though, you're not going to be really reading these tables raw unless you've really done like all the filtration. Um, what I'm going to be asking you to do is use this as an input for a PCOA. Now, this will actually be what we are um, exploring next week in class. Um, so I will have to just come back to that. Um, I want the distance values. We're not going to use the standard error um, within this analysis. So I'm just going to give us 10 decimal places, put on the lower left side, and add them to an Excel file for now so that it opens up in Excel. I've already done this. So let me just cancel out of that, open this up, and here they are. Now it's a little bit hard to see. So let me make those columns a little bit shorter. Cool. Um, that made it small enough that you can't see the data, but what's fun is you can actually do some coloring and now you can actually see some patterns within the data. Um, so I'm guessing these are all the uh, malice species. Yes, they are, I can see it right there. Um, so you can see that there are two groups within that uh, genus. So that's pretty fun. Uh, clearly, whatever's across these rows um, are very similar. So that's all the grape. Again, a horticultural species where cloning is routine. So um, again, not surprised that someone has spent a lot of time trying to characterize this gene across that genus. Um, and looking across, I see a few other clusters. Let's see what that one is. Ah, some brassicas. There you go. So. Um, probably somewhere in here, I could find out that like one of these other groups that it's similar to is probably Arabidopsis, since Arabidopsis, Arabidopsis is a Brassicales member. Um, so here's some Cornus. I don't know much about Cornus. But anyways, this is your distance uh, matrix. You'll notice it's just one side of the matrix. Um, if you want to, here's a trick that I have used um, quite a bit and that is to use the transpose uh, ability. So that is right click, transpose. And then what's fun is you can just add them together. So let's create a third sheet. Get the full amount of information. Let me just scroll out. And then I can just use a formula to add together the values 
of each of those boxes. An issue being that it will produce zero at an identity instead of um, both, in which case I just need to give it a logical value. So we'll say if and equals blank and this one equals blank. If those are both true, then just use blank. Otherwise, add them together. And since it'll be zero plus whatever else it, um, zero, uh, it'll be either nothing plus the number, um, this will give us the information we need. So if I go to the end of my region, let me delete all those extra cells I created. There we go. Um, so now I'm going to carry it over. So I'm gonna select all of those, double click this box to drag it down. And there we go. Nice, beautiful symmetrical matrix. Uh, much, very easy to use within downstream analyses. And so um, that would be a, a great way to save this as a CSV, import that into um, um, R for downstream analyses. It would also be one of your um, supplemental files. You can also just export this original view as a CSV, and that's what we'll do um, in class as part of the principal component um, lesson. And so <laughs> I know you really like science. Um, and so you, we will do that in class, so we'll show that one later. Um, with that, let me pause it and start up uh, another analysis, and then we'll come restart it and show you how to generate a tree, a cladogram. All right, we are returning, um, and we're going to talk about the actual phylogenetic analysis um, that is going to take these distance algorithms and instead try instead of trying to like just generate all of the values between all of the samples, it's going to try to summarize that information in a couple of dimensions that enough that you can have an order and some clustering within that order. So in other words, it's going to apply a limited principal uh, coordinate analysis within this data. So to do that, we can click on the phylogeny button. Um, you'll notice that there is a lot of different uh, options. Now, going through these, like there is a help file which allows you to dig into all of these with some great suggestions. Um, generally, the most common one you will see is the maximum likelihood tree. Um, and it, it is also the most computationally intensive. That said, I did a much larger analysis than I'm asking you to do. So I did many, many uh, versions of genes across a uh, multiply sampled uh, phylogeny. And so even then, it only took a couple of minutes for my 173 to 200 uh, amino acid long sequence. And so it, it's not that bad. Um, what, what that means is just use the maximum likelihood. You're welcome to compare it to the others. And again, if you are comparing this, um, that would be sufficient for a um, extra credit point. So um, when I click on this, um, it's going to ask if I want to use the active data. So yes, I do. I don't want to load new data. Um, if I'm testing for the phylogeny, you should probably choose a bootstrap, but the first time you run it, just for the sake of time, you may just want to not run a bootstrap and use the results to go through and filter your data down to a more reasonable level. So when you click OK, that analysis for mine took about a minute and a half, wasn't too bad. When you ran the bootstraps, it's just going to be um, significantly longer. So you'll probably want to let that bootstrap just run over a long period of time depending on the power of your computer. Uh, so with that, I've already ran this, so I'm just going to pull those results up. So this is what popped up after I finished. Um, what you can see is the default view does not have the same length of all of the branches, which is great because it allows us to kind of visualize, well, what is its confidence in some of these clusterings? So like it has all of these malice species up at this top group, and what it's finding is that there is not a lot of distinction. So they branch because that's how the algorithm works. It has to form branches. 
um, but they're all very close together horizontally speaking. And so what that implies is that there isn't much difference between them. They're all very similar. On the other hand, there is a major branching point, well, a major enough that um, there are multiple species besides malice up in this top group, and then there are multiple species in this bottom group. What this implies is that there must be two copies of this gene within this plant, uh, this group of plants. Now, Pyrus, is that peach? I should know that. I've contributed to papers on peach, if that is peach. Pyrus. Oh, it's pear. Pear, pear, pear. Of course. I haven't done any pear for research. So, whew, that was close. Um, cool. So, clearly, there has been some sort of divergence. Um, later in the evolution of this group, um, presumably before uh, this is peach, uh, branched off. So that's pretty cool. Or is it peach or is it plum? Uh, yeah. All right. It's one of them. It is plum. Ugh, I did bad. What's peach? Oh, it's also prunus. All right. I'm, I'm better now. Okay. So uh, going down. I can see that these kind of patterns are replicated, that I have uh, local diversities within genuses or geni and some other groupings, um, some of which are more divergent than others. So some have very long arms. Here I can see that this Vicia has a lot of interesting diversity. Uh, sometimes I have fragments of genes and so I probably want to maybe try filtering my data so that if I did have a Vicia um, representative, maybe I only had one where it was the whole gene sequence. Uh, here is, like I was saying before, someone where they called it center radialis instead of TFL based on the, the original name of the gene. And so we can kind of go through and view this. Now, this is partly why I said you should limit your study. When you have all of these different levels of similarity, it can really complicate interpretation because I have a lot of other uh, variances and relationships that are driving some of my clustering. Like here in Vitis, um, I have multiple species of Vitis. Um, I'm, yeah, there's, I'm not surprised, but there's a couple of different entries just for Vitis vinifera, which is like, um, I guess European grapes, um, just what most people think of as grapes. Um, here's one that's from uh, the United States, I believe. Um, but Vitis has a lot of different entries in here and that's driving a lot of this analysis. And so when I ask you to give me a kind of even sampling, you would use this initial data set to then go back, trim down your data and then use that determined panel to help guide the rest of your analyses. So ideally you would probably just uh, pick out the most complete sequences for the top 20 species and then use all that information to guide your downstream analysis. Um, in the end, you can export it via different ways. Um, probably the easiest way though is to just export it as an image and then you can include that as either a supplemental file or as the image in your actual paper. Now, um, I say all that, there's also some really fun stuff that you can do within all the icons. Uh, again, they've written extensive help files. You, can, you should feel free to browse these. Um, you can get some pretty cool stuff. If I want to only view like the actual clustering information without regards to any sort of like confidence and how much the clustering occurred, this makes it much easier to read through and maybe even helps you with some of that initial subsetting. Uh, finally, where somewhere in here, I can switch to an unrooted tree and that always looks really cool. Um, let's see, I haven't done this one in a while. Also, I, <laughs> I mostly use uh, Mega 7, so we're a few <laughs> iterations away. Um, yeah, you can get some curly. Not a big fan of the curly, but hey, there you go. It looks pretty. Yeah. And if you're feeling real fancy, you can do a circle or a radiation style plot. 
And this is often quite nice for really large panels and other things where there is just a lot of information that you're trying to visualize at the same time. Um, I have published this style. Um, so, I mean, it, it's certainly accepted. Uh, it can be hard to read as I think you'll be able to agree with me that this is difficult to read. And so one thing that can pay off is for you to trim, usually using G sub, some of these file names. Um, but yeah, so that's my introduction to the phylogeny analysis. Um, next Thursday is when we will actually generate a short pairwise distance algorithm. I'll probably just do that on my own computer. And then you, I'll share that with you and you will use a principal component analysis to go from that distance matrix to an actual uh, principal component analysis in R. And so with that, um, I'm gonna sign off. Thank you so much and I hope that helps and good luck, send me emails and remember, this is an inquiry project. Like the goal isn't really to be right. The goal is to engage with the research. If you are doing that, I am happy. Um, I just need you to give me that evidence so that I can say, yeah, this, the student engaged in the process. They weren't always right, but um, that's fine. Most of the criteria for the project don't require you to be right. They require you to have done the work, done some communication about um, this process. So thank you and have a good weekend and week.